Hello. You can follow the history of Warhammer like a map, taking you through the development of wargaming, miniatures manufacturing, and one of the biggest tabletop gaming companies in the world. And by the time of Warhammer 5th edition, that map would lead us to treasure. And monsters. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today we're continuing part 4 of the making of Warhammer Fantasy. The mid to late 90s was an interesting period at Games Workshop. 5th edition Warhammer was a relatively stable release at a time when everything else seemed anything but. There had long existed a fine cultural balance between on the one hand creativity, fun and games design, and on the other targets, marketing and sales. And under the first reign of Tom Kirby, things would start to skew ever further towards that sales side. The tension at the heart of the two wolves of Games Workshop would come to a devastating head in 1997, when a sales-led decision threatened to drown the entire company in orcish, green, gruesome, Gorkamorkan blood. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The fifth edition of Fantasy Battles would be an opportunity for original Warhammer co-creator Rick Priestley to delicately refine his original creation one last time. This wasn't his swan song at GW, he'd still be involved in some important future games, but this was his final hands-on project leading development of a core Warhammer release. Truthfully, whilst Warhammer 5th edition may have been an heroic effort, in retrospect, its impact is dwarfed by the events that took place around it. By the end of its four-year cycle, Games Workshop would be almost unrecognisable. Before we delve into that history though, I just wanted to thank you for giving this video a watch and if you enjoyed it, giving it a like as well. And if you want to support the channel and the work I'm doing here, then please feel free to consider joining my Patreon. There's absolutely no obligation whatsoever, but if you're interested, you can follow the link in the description below. Earlier in the series, we've witnessed how Games Workshop reoriented its entire business around the sale of Warhammer, a game originally conceived of as a way to sell more miniatures to role-playing gamers. The RPG elements of the original Warhammer game had long since been involved out, and now it was a true wargame experience. It was continuing to push towards more balanced competitive gaming, and seeking out new demographics of players to grow the hobby. Warhammer Fantasy's 4th edition and 40k's 2nd edition had both been sold in an accessible starter box, designed to be the perfect way to begin the Warhammer hobby. The lore of these worlds was enriched and nominally advanced through the regular release of the faction-specific army books, a business model that had served Games Workshop and its players well throughout the edition. I'm not a technical expert in editing and publishing technology, nor do I know much about photography, paint, or miniatures manufacture. But as I understand it, the 90s brought about a series of innovations and technological advancements that made it cheaper, simpler and quicker to sculpt more detailed miniatures, mix more vibrant paints, photograph more colourful pictures and cheaply publish more frequent colour pages. New cardboard printing technologies allowed for cheaper and sturdier card terrain. White Dwarf was now a full colour magazine and regularly included cardboard inserts for you to cut out and use in your games. Mike McVeigh's complete revision of the Citadel colour range hit shelves in 1994 with the magnificent hex pots. If anyone still has a sealed pot of Deadly Nightshade, please let me know but the entire range would be completely reformulated again in 1998 with the introduction of the cool looking but regrettably ill-advised screw top bolt gun bullet pots. And of course, metal and plastic miniatures tooling and materials also developed during this time, allowing for more delicately sculpted miniatures that could retain crisper, cleaner detail, have thinner parts and hold more dynamic poses. Metal miniature sculpting was now carried out using epoxy or green stuff as standard, with vulcanized rubber molds used in the casting process. The formerly ubiquitous plastic monopose units would soon be phased out, as would many of the mixed material models which were primarily metal with plastic components like shields, arms or backpacks. 
In early 1997, Citadel Miniatures factory manager Paul Robbins shared details on the introduction of a new material for metal model manufacture. What we've come up with is a new white metal alloy that is totally lead free. The new material casts well, produces sharper crisper detail and results in fewer miscasts and thus fewer defective miniatures. If you were in the hobby around the time of the introduction of white metal, you may well remember the Games Workshop fire sale that took place where blisters were about 50p or a pound each. I remember carrying as many lead models as I could in my hands. And then, I don't really remember much else. Paul Robbins and his factory team had a very busy 1997 indeed. After introducing white metal, they also introduced a limited edition Thunderhawk gunship at 28mm scale. This was essentially a display piece. It was completely made of metal, came in a bespoke wooden box, and cost £400. Something like 500 of these pieces were released worldwide, but they proved that there was a desire for larger scale, less immediately playable miniatures from Games Workshop. In time, these new casting processes and materials would allow Citadel miniatures to create more complex and larger models than ever before. But for now, a new force was about to come online at Games Workshop's Miniature Manufactorum. This was the beginning of Forge World. Over the past few years, a couple of small independent companies in the United States had carried a license to produce resin titans, tanks, and monstrosities at 40k scale. One company was called Armorcast, and it's actually still around today, producing 28mm terrain and cinematic effects like gun flares. Also, these grenades, which may look like cute owls, but are definitely not. The other company is assuredly not still around today. It was called Forge World Models. Using the same Armorcast sculpts, they produced titans for sale elsewhere in the US, and after just a year in business, they lost their license to produce Games Workshop models at all. In 1996, they closed down, and a year later, Games Workshop's Forge World began. A specialty resin miniature manufacturer that produced terrain, display pieces, and mammoth models for use in 40k and Warhammer. With Forge World spinning up to make larger resin miniatures, and Citadel's evolving plastics capability, future games would start to shift towards a greater focus on monstrous units, large vehicles, and display style centerpiece models. Pretty soon, the games were going to start getting, for want of a more impressive word, big. But we'll get to that another time. For now, Games Workshop's biggest concern was still its shareholders and investors. The 1991 management buyout led by Tom Kirby had leveraged the company to the tune of £40 million in venture capital debt, and that was eating up the annual profit margin. According to Rick Priestley, that's quite a lot of pressure with houses and everything you own being on the line. No matter how much you love what you're doing, you have to stay solvent to keep on doing it. And we grew the business organically from a turnover of just 10 million to about 100 million in 10 years. Despite healthy sales, there was only limited funding available to invest in new games development, and there was increasingly an appetite at the top of the company to focus on 40k and Warhammer Fantasy spin-offs rather than some of the wild and wonderful concepts that the design studio might have preferred to work on. But whilst the design, development and creation of new games was being more tightly controlled, the rest of the company was still growing and spending. They acquired a host of international distributors in countries like France and Australia, and continued to invest in the retail operations of countries like America, as well as strengthening the manufacturing processes and facilities. That meant that the original Ansel plan of creating a vertically integrated games workshop was coming to fruition. They could increasingly control the entire production line, from designing a game to manufacturing it to selling it in their own stores around the world or at third-party independent retailers. But as the company became more and more corporate and bigger, the corporate culture also became bigger as well. Rick Priestley described the prevailing headwinds for games development of the time. Games Workshop by then had a very specific remit. The making of the toy soldiers and the marketing of the toy soldiers was so much the bigger driver that you had to tailor the game around what you could make in the way of toy soldiers. Of course, whilst an increasingly corporate and professionalized sales-driven company can often stymie creativity, 
there would still be many years of incredible Games Workshop games to come. After all, there's Weirdstone in them that hills. But before that, there would be a new edition of Warhammer. Games Workshop would move the furniture around a little. Maybe slide that desk over there. Give everything a bit of a dust. The changes between 1st and 2nd edition of Warhammer may well represent the smallest shift between versions of the game, but the transition from 4th to 5th comes pretty close. 5th edition of the Game of Fantasy Battles is an exercise in incremental evolution. There is no major change to the rules, there is not a significant shift in the way the game is played or how it fundamentally works. There is a new starter box that clarifies and cleans up the rule set, and of course two new races are added to the lineup. But this is not a sea change in the game, it is a refinement and a clarification. And yet, Rick Priestley still describes 4th and 5th edition as his favourite version of Warhammer, a return to the 2nd edition approach but with restructured and less convoluted rules. This new edition of Warhammer was once again written by Rick Priestley, with only his name appearing in the writing credits of either of the books included in the new starter box. Later interviews, publications and articles would refer to some of the other design studio staff who helped to develop and test the game though, including legends such as Jervis Johnson. By 1996, Rick Priestley had long since secured his legacy as one of Games Workshop's greatest designers. He had worked for the company for 14 years, and had produced four editions of Warhammer, two editions of 40k, the backbone of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, and had been the driving force behind innumerable other projects besides. With his company tenure and experience, Rick Priestley found that he was increasingly being drawn away from game making to business leading. Following the management buyout in 91, he took on the role of Director of Product Design, and recalls, I was responsible for the entire product range, plastic tooling and print buying. And though he wouldn't go on to develop any more Warhammer, he still had a few gifts left in store for GW Gamers before he would leave the company. Jervis Johnson, meanwhile, had been writing GW Games for several years having by this point invented Blood Bowl, developed Advanced Hero Quest, and written Adeptus Titanicus. According to a White Dwarf retrospective on Jervis Johnson's career, Jervis returned to the fantasy realm to help Rick Priestley with the 5th edition. By this point, Jervis was focusing his efforts more on rules writing than background writing. The Games Workshop starter box was now a well-established format, and 5th edition would build on the fantasy battle and 40k releases that had come before it. In the set, you'd get a rules book and a battle book, the former providing all of the core rules you needed to play the game, and the latter offering up campaign rules, scenarios, how to collect an army guides, and the now standard bestiary and Warhammer World lore sections. The rules changes for the edition were simple enough that it was possible for them to be summarised pretty effectively in just one double page spread of White Dwarf. Changes included things like modifications to aerial combat, revisions to how skirmishes worked, and an insistence that if you were to spot Rick Priestley in the pub with an empty beer glass, you were on about to buy him a round of drinks. I genuinely agree with this rule, I'm pretty sure we all owe him a beer. There were also dice, card templates, and some magic cards in the box. A very helpful pad of roster sheets so that you could detail your army list in your neatest handwriting, plus three new card buildings illustrated by Richard Wright, the in-house artist responsible for those terrific Warhammer Quest floor tiles. The buildings could be constructed to give you a tower, a small house, and a shed over which to fight your first battles. But of course, the real centerpiece were the frames holding two mighty armies returning to the Warhammer world after what felt like an eternity, the Bretonians and the Lizardmen. In fact, it had only been one edition since Bretonians were fully detailed in the Warhammer Army's book, along with the Lizardmen who operated as vassal troops of the Slan. But by 1996, the era of the third edition already felt like ancient history. And now I just feel like I'm old enough to remember the primordial ooze and stuff of chaos at the beginning of the universe. The two forces present in the box gave you enough to get playing some simple games right away. For the Bretonians, there were 12 Knights of the Realm, and 24, no doubt well-fed, content, and happy, peasant bowmen, versus the Lizardmen army of 20 Saurus warriors and 32 Skink archers, 
all of which were made of cutting-edge Citadel plastic, and some of which could actually be built with variant options and poseable components. According to Rick Priestley, the intention for the addition was to tidy up some rules, clarify some loose ends, and to just release a new starter box. And that was explicitly explained by Priestley in the White Dwarf launch article for this edition. We weren't exactly sure how much to change and how much to keep. We were pretty sure about one thing. Having spent the past four years building up our armies and writing Warhammer Armies books, there was no way we were going to make all of that effort redundant. Any changes would have to be compatible with existing supplements. And this extends to the armies books that had been released already as well. Whilst there was a possibility that existing armies would get retooled, have new units released or otherwise require significant reworks, the general assumption was that you would not need or be expected to buy a new version of your army book. In the 4th and 5th edition of the game, the world of Warhammer had been increasingly formalised and nailed down. Contradictions were gently retconned or eradicated entirely, and certain thornier aspects of the world were done away with. Races like Fimir, Zotes, Amazons, Pygmies, and Troglodytes all faded into the background. The Slan were reintroduced as a guiding force of good, with hints of their starfaring past kept intact. Nagash had been firmly established by now as a great and powerful force, and the Chaos Wastes were given more character and meaning in this world. The timeline of the Old World was updated and made more consistent as well, and the political, martial, and magical status quo of the world was more firmly established. The world of Warhammer had matured into a consistent setting that afforded players with endless opportunities for battles and adventures, even if many of its corners remained unexplored. As with 4th edition, there was also a commitment to making the game more accessible and welcoming to newer, younger players. Then White Dwarf contributor and game studio designer Thomas Piranin remembered during an interview with Mirror Manga what it was like at the time. The Warhammer look and feel was much more cartoony. The management wanted to make it more approachable for a younger audience. Warhammer art hadn't become a bloodless affair, but there was a growing focus on glamour shots, exaggerated expressions, comedic vignettes, and simpler, cleaner lines. Much of the art from this era remains iconic and impressive, and to my eye, the Warhammer world was still depicted as a dangerous place indeed. The box art for 5th edition was by Mark Gibbons, and it still illustrates a brutal and chaotic world full of bloody battles. In a 2017 Reddit AMA, Mark Gibbons was asked about the GW art style around the time of 5th edition. Artists tended to cycle in and out of the GW design studio, so I think the style was always pretty fluid, reflecting who was working there at the time. A diversity of style was encouraged. He added elsewhere in the thread, when I was working at GW in the 90s, there was a wide variety of individual art styles. Adrian Smith's work would be on a page next to Wayne England's, you know? Couldn't get more different. Wayne England, Jeff Taylor, Adrian Smith, Toby Haynes, Paul Smith, and of course John Blanche were amongst the many other artists who provided covers, illustrations, and concepts for the many 5th edition releases, with a great number of defining works produced during this era. There would soon even be a comic book launch that inherited some of the general art style of the time, Warhammer Monthly. And just as the art continued to deliver incredible visuals, so too did the miniatures. The Warhammer range was full of magnificent sculpts across all of the races. Alan Perry's Chaos Dwarves, Michael Perry's Beastmen, Ali Morrison's Dark Elves, Trish Carden's Monsters and Mounts, Colin Dixon's Dwarves, Kev Adams' Goblins, Norman Swale's War Machines, Jez Goodwin's Skaven, and Gary Morley's Undead, to name just a few, all offer up memorable and legendary miniatures. As with the previous edition, one of the first expansions released was a box full of magic and cards. Mostly cards. Like the core 5th edition rules, this was largely an exercise in cleaning up and refining the rules that had come before. The box included updated versions of magic items, spells, tokens, and templates covering the wide array of magic available in the game. With the intention for this edition being that earlier supplements remained valid and appropriately powered, there were fewer new Warhammer Armies books released this time around. But after their introduction in 4th edition, the whole concept of Armies books was now firmly entrenched as a key part of the Games Workshop release cycle. Rick Priestley has since reflected on the tension between design and sales over the contents of these books. We got a lot of pressure from the sales companies to reduce the price of the Army books. As originally conceived, 
These would be source books, not just army lists, but background books and painting and modeling. I spec'd them to 96 pages, but that meant that they had to be a certain price. And we got a lot of pressure back that went basically, we want to be able to sell these for five pounds. Can you get rid of all of the fluff? I'm a big fan of army books and the bespoke faction fluff that comes within them. So I'm glad that Rick Priestley and the design team fought hard to maintain that part of the books. Two of the earliest factions that received Army's books in 5th edition were of course the brand new Old Races, the Bretonians and the Lizardmen. Both books were written by Warhammer Army's scribe Nigel Stillman, who had continued to refine his approach to balanced army list writing. In the White Dwarf launch article for the new edition of the game, Rick Priestley had promised a complete overhaul of the army book for High Elves, and that would be released in 1997, written by pretty much the entire Warhammer design team. Andy Chambers, Jess Goodwin, Bill King, Thomas Prinanen, and Rick Priestley himself. The new High Elves book was joined by something a little bit more grandiose, and a large bit more ruinous, a new take on the Realm of Chaos. Unlike the third edition books, this was a box set, that covered all four Chaos Gods, as well as splitting the forces of Chaos out into separate army lists for beasts, warriors, and demons of Chaos. The set was written by rising star designer Thomas Pyrrhonin, working with his mentor Rick Priestley. Pyrrhonin would add to this set with a Champions of Chaos book as well, originally intended to be in the box, but which just couldn't fit. This book would see the introduction of Archeon to the world of Warhammer, and if you don't know him, you might want to remember that name. They would also attempt to ground the forces of chaos in the Warhammer world in an arguably more logical way. Pyrrhonin actually gave a really interesting lecture about the development of these supplements and his interpretation of chaos at RopeCon in 2017, which was recorded and I've linked to that video in the description below. In fact, RopeCon has had some very cool guest speakers over the years and seems to be a really cool convention, so worth checking out if you fancy going to Finland, I suppose. Stillman, Pyrrhonin and Priestley would also collaborate on the creation of the Dogs of War Armies book, a collection of regiments of renown, mercenary legends and otherwise unusual chaps who could either join existing armies as specialised units or form a mercenary army all of their own. This was an at times bizarre creation, what with the werebears and the birdmen, but it was a lot of fun and one of my favourite supplements for the game. The only missing piece is, in my opinion, the lack of any grudge bringers. The final Army's book released for 5th edition was by Alessio Cavatore and Thomas Pyrrhonin, and it was dedicated to the Vampire Counts. This was the first time that the aristocracy of the night was separated from the forces of Nagash, stepping apart from the more traditional melange of undead that had been covered in the 4th edition Army's book to become a cool faction of Sylvanian families. In a return to an old 3rd edition favourite, there would be a new edition of the Siege Rulebook released in 1998, accompanied by a new version of the Mighty Fortress. Unlike the original Polystyrene Fortress, which I did mistakenly say was made of plastic, this one actually was made of plastic. The rulebook covered everything you'd expect to see, attacking, defending, destroying and building fortresses were all covered, along with siege equipment like battering rams and boiling oil. Another reprise from earlier editions of Warhammer would be the glorious return of the Campaign Box. For 5th edition, there would be five in total. Dwarves vs High Elves in the Grudge of Drong, Orcs and Goblins vs the Empire in Idol of Gork, Bretonians vs the Undead in Circle of Blood, Bretonians again vs Wood Elves in Perilous Quest, and High Elves vs Dark Elves in Tears of Aisha. Like their second edition ancestors, these would be boxed sets including a full story about the meeting of two forces over a series of connected battles. They would typically be uneven, narrative-driven scenarios, with results that influence the final fight of the story. And though they didn't include any miniatures in the box, some special characters would be released separately if you wanted to fully recreate the story. A major selling point for the sets was that they included a wealth of new cardboard terrain themed around the armies in the campaign totally awesome stuff. And what, I hear you ask, of Hero Hammer, a nickname that came about because of all of the special rules and magic items and exploits that you could use to create incredibly powerful heroes, wizards and special characters. They were so strong that they undermined the very idea of taking a unit of regular troops at all. In his reflections on 5th edition, Rick Priestley has reminisced thus. 
I know that some players sometimes refer to these 90s editions as Hero Hammer because of all the special characters and rules. Whilst these special characters were always imagined to be characterful and fun, they started to be treated as an integral part of the game, often dominating play to the exclusion of everything else. Our sales guys encouraged that I believe, and therein lies the problem. At a RopeCon event in 1996, Andy Chambers shared a different yet complementary perspective, where he emphasised that special characters were only ever really intended to be taken as illustrative, rather than game-breaking auto-picks. An element about special characters which most people don't grasp, which is that they're not primarily there to give you, again, some great uber character that you can smash your opponent with. We use them as an opportunity to take an individual, we've written all about a race or a particular chapter, but it's a chance to take an individual and say, well, how does that apply to this person? Yeah? We talk about having chaos laws, what's one of those like? Yeah, we've got a stat line in the army, that's sure, but that doesn't tell you anything at all about how they, how you should perceive them, what they should be like, what kind of history they should have. So that's what mainly why we do special characters, is so that we can really illuminate, spotlight a particular area of the army, a particular worshipper of a chaos god in the chaos of the world and the chaos of the The primal, cardinal tension in the game of Warhammer has arguably always been the uneasy distinction between playing for fun and playing just to win, a situation that was arguably exacerbated by 5th edition's exploitable systems, formidable stat blocks, and the hard push into selling singular powerful characters. And it wasn't just a tension that was present in the player base either, they'd noticed in the design studio too. Around this time, Nigel Stillman was asked to begin writing a series of articles in White Dwarf to be called Stillmania. The series was intended to help new gamers get started with building and painting an army, without becoming overwhelmed by the entirety of the hobby. On the Give em Lead blog in 2016, Stillman recalled, in those days, there was concern about players manipulating the game and spoiling it by over-competitive play, and that this tendency, already observed among historical players, might scare away new recruits to the hobby. Also, collecting a big army might be daunting. And yet, in 1996, Jervis Johnson revealed his new format for the Games Workshop sanctioned International Grand Tournament. The system was designed to enable tournament competition by players from around the world on an even footing. To keep things friendly and in the presumed spirit of Warhammer, Johnson included points awards for the best painted army and the most sportsmanly play. This wasn't the first Warhammer tournament, it wasn't even the first world playoffs. That had been the Osprey World Warhammer Fantasy Battle Championship hosted at Games Day 1989. One of those playoff games received a battle report in White Dwarf 117 which ended with the note, this battle was a credit to both players, who conducted themselves in a sportsmanlike manner and avoided the temptation of trying to find gimmick armies. But nevertheless, this was the beginning of a move towards tournaments becoming a huge and in many ways dominant aspect of the hobby. The Grand Tournament would become an annual event, and it would only grow in scope and scale over time. The pursuit of balance to keep these events fair would become a central theme of discussion and design. By 2002, Jervis Johnson would take to his J Files column in the Citadel Journal, issue 48, to muse on this cultural shift in more detail. We've been finding that far too many players, and often players who should really know better, are starting to treat our games a little too competitively. These players only seem to be interested in playing tournament style games, and they seem only able to get their jollies by winning the games they play in any way they can. No, it's more worrying than that, as these players who seem to think that tournament style games are really the only proper way to play, and that this style of gaming is what the hobby is really all about. Johnson goes on to suggest that army books, codexes, white dwarf battle reports, and the grand tournament itself may have all contributed to this increasingly competitive focus, and that actually there was a creative wellspring on offer if you could just leave behind points costs and play some narrative games instead. So there was simultaneously a fear that overly competitive play and tournament games could be damaging the hobby, or at least making it more difficult for new players to get into it. Yet at the same time, Games Workshop had just established a fundamental framework around which an ever more competitive culture would be built, 
Whatever one's feelings about competitive versus less competitive approaches to gameplay, it was clear that there was a tidal change happening, even if members of the design team were resistant to it. But that high tide would be nothing compared to the tsunami that was approaching Games Workshop, one that would bring with it a flood of orcs. In the years after the release of Warhammer Fantasy Battles 5th Edition, there would be a series of products and business decisions at Games Workshop that would have long-lasting ramifications. These are not actually Warhammer editions, so I don't want to spend too much time on them here, but they do provide important context about how Games Workshop would change its approach to developing and releasing games over time. The following three editions of Warhammer would all be affected by what happened here. In 1997, Andy Jones, creator of Warhammer Quest, amongst many other things at GW, would spearhead the founding of a new publishing imprint for Games Workshop fiction, the Black Library. GW Books had been attempted before with mixed success, but this time the new publishing arm would go from strength to phenomenal strength, releasing many New York Times bestsellers and powering the expansion and deepening of the lore, particularly in 40k, in a way that hadn't been seen before. In that same year, there would be a new big box side game released that would cause a literal restructure of the business and the end of the creative-led development process. That game was Gorkamorka, and it was a commercial disaster. Now, the story of Gorkamorka is a fascinating one, filled as it is with corporate hubris, complex miscalculation, and the heroic and innovative efforts of the design studio given a fraction of the time they would expect to develop a new game. It has been intricately detailed on the Goonhammer blog in a series of articles written by Aaron Bowen and Liam Royal. I've linked those in the description below and they're well worth a read. I will at some point probably cover this story on the channel because it's astonishing really, but for now let's stick to the relevant summary. That the design team was asked to delay the game they'd been working on for a 1997 release, Warmaster, in favour of rushing out a 40k set game that could be pushed hard in the run up to Christmas. Rather than the typical minimum 12 months it usually took to develop a big box release, Andy Chambers and his team were given just 8 weeks and they had to make use of kits that were largely already near completion, the orc trucks and bikes. The fact that Gorkamorka is an incredibly fun game is remarkable, that it sold well is not too surprising given that everyone loves orcs, but the fact that it was a disastrous failure is inexplicable. Overproduction, sky-high sales expectations, sell or return contracts, all of it contributed to a massive financial disaster. Games Workshop was left in an impossible situation on the brink of failure. They had to restructure the organisation, remove key roles from certain teams, and change the way future games would be developed. Somehow, despite the fact that sales had driven the Gorkomorka debacle in the first place, they came out of it with a new sense of power. Sales were placed at the start of the decision-making process for future game development. The design studio would now be marching to the drumbeat of the sales teams. Where once the studio and design had been at the heart of Games Workshop, now it was the sales team. Even with all of those stresses and strains, in 1998 Rick Priestley would deliver a new, non-core Games Workshop game, one that took his most recent Warhammer system in a brand new direction, back to the past. Warhammer Ancient Battles would present a way to play historical war games using a modified version of the 5th edition rule set. John Stallard, Games Workshop sales director and board member around that time, remembers Rick, the Perry Twins and Jervis Johnson persuaded Tom Kirby that they should be allowed to publish Warhammer Historical. Tom said, Alright, you can make a set of rules based around Warhammer, but you can't make any models. So Warhammer Ancients came out, a jolly good game by Jervis, the Perrys and Rick. They made a lovely book, but it was done as a separate entity. The books were kept well away from Games Workshop, kept away from the stores. It was kept away from anything to do with Games Workshop, but it still sold well, sold a few thousand copies, and there were reprints. The Warhammer Historical series would see many expansions over the next 10 years, with contributions from other GW staff like Nigel Stillman. But by 2010, the games had largely stopped being published, and a couple of years later, Games Workshop formally dissolved the imprint that had released them. There was another release in 1998, one that would set the stage for Games Workshop's long-term financial recovery and redemption after Gorkamorka. It was the third edition 
of 40k. Although the transition from Warhammer 3rd edition to 4th edition had seen a lot of simplification, the streamlining that marked the change between 40k 2nd and 3rd editions was something else entirely. Core rules were stripped back, many special rules were removed, armies were simplified, and overall the game was made considerably more accessible and beginner friendly. This new version of Warhammer 40,000 laid the solid bedrock that the next four editions would be built on, and it paved the way for the incomparable success of the game. Warhammer Fantasy itself would soon see a shakeup to its own rule systems, but none of it would be as significant or as successful as what happened here with 40k, for better and for worse. Late in the life of Warhammer 5th edition, there would be another game built on its core systems, though it would seek to avoid the special character dominated rank and flank gameplay. Instead of using armies, you would use warbands, and instead of fighting on the many battlefields of the Warhammer world, it would focus on the streets of just one damned city. This was Mordheim. Designed by Thomas Pyrrhonin and a creative super team from the Citadel studio, and released just ahead of the peak Millennium Doomsaying, Mordheim took the small-scale skirmish style of Necromunda and placed it in the scarred city streets of Desolate Damnation. Small warbands of around 10 characters would face off in objective-based games across a vertical ruin of an Empire city, with each miniature operating independently rather than in coordinated units. The setting and art design of Mordheim is incredible. And despite receiving only a single edition, the game's phenomenal theming, artwork and writing has ensured a lasting legacy, and lead designer Pyrrhonin would be the next to wield the Warhammer itself. My patrons actually recently voted on Mordheim as a priority video, so you can expect to see a history of the game appearing on the channel soon. I'm very excited about it. After the end of the Warhammer 5th edition era, Rick Priestley would take a step back from Warhammer development, being involved only from a distance. He would continue to act as Thomas Pyrrhonin's mentor, as well as contributing as a member of the wider development team, but he would not hold the pen for any more Warhammer editions. Later on, it would be Priestley along with Andy Jones who would convince Games Workshop to invest in a pitch to New Line Cinema for the Lord of the Rings license, and he would even develop the core rules for that game. Over time, Rick Priestley found that he was less and less involved in the development of new games, and more and more involved in the development of new business. In interviews since, he has expressed some frustration about his move from the gaming table to the boardroom table. And with the culture of Games Workshop increasingly focused on sales and growth, he decided that the time had come for him to move on. In around 2009, the Wizard of Warhammer, the father of 40k, the greatest game designer that Games Workshop has ever known, decided it was time to step away from the worlds that he had ushered into life. There have been many great minds at work through the history of Warhammer, but to my mind, without Rick Priestley, there would be no Warhammer to work on at all. The cities and mountains and rivers of the Warhammer world flowed from his pen, as did the realms and races and rules. The 41st millennium took shape because he willed it into being. He gave gangers a game, drunk dwarves a drink, and offered up endless wars for us to master. Core games, specialist games, mini games and board games, Rick Priestley wrote something of everything. For me, Rick Priestley has always been the heart of Warhammer, and for that I owe him a piece of mine. So thank you Mr Priestley, for designing the games I play, and writing the worlds that I imagine. Yours have been the best games that I've ever played. And yeah, Drunk Dwarves, I'm definitely going to be playing this one on camera at some point. So the late 90s were a glorious time for Warhammer. The 5th edition was a comfortable release that changed just enough of what it needed to, but was essentially content to be an accessible, playable version of the game of fantasy battles. It hadn't evolved very much, because it just didn't need to. And yet, there were cultural shifts happening all around it. 40k was becoming more dominant, miniatures were becoming more complicated, players were looking for more balanced and more competitive games, and the business was becoming even more focused on sales. There would be a need for a newer version of Warhammer 
that could make something of the rank and flank gameplay once again, remove the overpowered heroes, and develop a world that was textured enough to be captivating for existing players, but accessible enough to bring in new ones. But what nobody knew just yet was that there was another fantasy world about to give Games Workshop a ring to ask if they could come out to play. The Warhammer world was about to be in the orbit of not just the 41st millennium, but also in the shadow of the Middle Earth. Well, that was a lot of non-Warhammer in this making of Warhammer, but I thought the context was important. We've seen now what the 5th edition of the game looked like, and we know what the 6th edition is going to be stepping into. I hope that you've enjoyed this exploration, and that you'll continue to join me for the next parts as they come out. If you did like it, then feel free to subscribe to the channel, and if you really enjoyed it and want to support my work, you can check out my Patreon at the link below, though of course there is no obligation to do so. Thank you very much for watching, I'm Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery. Whilst I was listening to rock power ballads and working on the first draft of the introduction to this video, Martha decided to come in and make her presence known by sitting on my keyboard. I thought I would read to you the draft that she completed. See if you can work out where she stepped in. Hello. Here we go again on our own, journey through the history of Warhammer. Who made it? Why did they evolve it that way? And whatever happened to V... Weak.